Today I am the host at the MC, and I have the great honor of having Mary Carr with me. As you know, the format is quite easy and simple. I asked Mary to pick six films that, according to her, are forgotten gems, and I picked three. And I'm happy to say that we have one Japanese, one Russian, one French, one Italian, one American. Yes, and the results are Russian. Uh, so six different, very different films from all over the places. And uh, I would like to start immediately with Mary's first, first choice, which is the English film. I'm surprised, but also happily surprised, because this is an extraordinary film, but typically a filmmaker's choice. Uh, you are a poet, an author. Why did you pick this film? Um, well, I'm going to have to name drop. <laughs> Joel, Joel, Cohen, uh, Joel Cohen and I, whom I met at your house, have gotten to be good pals, and he kept in sin. We've had this long conversation about poetry and cinema, and he insisted I see it, and it wasn't on Criterion at the time. And then I meet Scorsese, not at your house, <laughs> and he says, can I get you any films? And I said, why, yes, as a matter of fact, I have a list that I keep on my phone. And he delivered them to my apartment, and this was the first one I, you know, a lot of people actually think or say, have said, it seems blasphemous in some ways, that this is the greatest English film. But the... Um, I love how lush it is. It's slightly hysterical in parts. It's kind of goofy. And it's the life and death of Colonel Blimp. Colonel Blimp was actually a, a comic strip of this kind of bloated, boorish uh, colonel. And so it's both satirical, but it's also about love and very moving. Do you know that Winston Churchill recognized himself in the character of uh, Major General Candy tried to stop the film? Oh, uh, oh, was it that? I thought it was because they were saying you can't win unless you, you fight as bad as the Nazis Absolutely. Do. <laughs> also because there is a very benign portrait of a, a German officer. Yes. Yeah. Right. And, and the Powell and Persburger first choice for the role was uh, Laurence Olivier. But he was serving in the army because it was shot during the war, and then. Uh, uh, but but I think the most interesting character in the film is the the woman Deborah Carr, almost your Deborah Carr, who yeah. plays three love interests across four decades, and so it's kind of. I mean, if you you know you want to talk about <laughs> you know feminist politics, you know you we there really is just one woman, and then she gets interleaved over the course of, of different people's lifetimes, but. She is so gorgeous, and her hats alone are worth the cost of the movie. Her hats are so divine. Um, having seen the film after your conversation about poetry and cinema uh, with Joel Cohen, did you learn anything from this film? Well, I, I learned, what did I learn? I mean, I think it's an epic, and I'm interested in epic and poetry, so it's an epic that, um, and it, it's very hard to excerpt from because the pieces, it, it's really, it winds up being about love, I think, love between this, these two duel mates or what, uh, opponents in a duel who, in recuperating from the very minor wounds they receive from each other, they become best friends. And then within two years, I think, uh, he searches out Theo in a prison camp. He's a German prisoner. He's been captured. And uh, he's shunned. Theo completely shuns him. And then flash forward 20 years, he's stuck in England, about to be, I think, imprisoned again as like a German spy. And the only person who knows him in the whole country is this guy. And he says, you can vouch for this man. You can, you can say you know him. He said, do I know him? And the love between these men, and also between Deborah Carr, who's initially married to Theo, and then he finds somebody who looks exactly like her, oddly enough, <laughs> on another continent, and convinces her to marry him. So I was completely, I, I'm, the, 
for me, I found it very moving. It's a very emotional movie for me. At the end, you know, Judith Thurman, who's here tonight, has a great line uh, when she was writing about Dante's Purgatorio that every sin is a sin against love. And in the beginning, and I think of Theo's rejection of his friend as a sin against love, and, and Colonel Blimp rejecting Deborah Carr when he's in love with her and can't admit it. And I think about those just long-term relationships. I just found it very emotional. Being a poet and an author, by the, using words, do you think that... Uh, everything is possible to be adapted on the screen, meaning using images instead of words. Or, if you want, I rephrase the question, do you think that cinema is an inferior form of art? So funny, that's what Joel always says. Yeah. He says it's a blunt instrument. Mm -hmm. You know, what you're doing now, that's something. You know, this is like a, and I, I think it's interesting because that's a movie of such spectacle but that, that also creates this tenderness in it. It seems to me like y'all are able to do it. I mean, you're a filmmaker. I mean, the people are able to do it, but not... Um, the filmmakers I know always make a joke, make a joke about it. Uh, as you, you came to Capri to our festival, as Judith, Ian, and many others, and um, I always ask this question to all the writers, and we had, I think, 180 guests, and I think 150 say that literature is by far superior. 30 <laughs> say that it's more or less equal. One, only one, say that cinema is much, much better. I will reveal the name at the end. Now, uh, now let's watch my clip. <laughs> Can I ask how many people know this film in this class? Three, four, all in first row. Oh, no, one in second row. <laughs> the director is Ellen Klimov an extraordinary filmmaker, Russian. Ian Stewart, do you know why it was called Ellen? This is, says a lot about this filmmaker. Ellen doesn't exist as a name. It's, uh, as you say, an acronym from Engels, Lenin, and Marx. Ah. Uh, that's the way he was educated. But he was not a communist. There, uh, his parents were. And he was trapped in the middle because he was not a communist and the Soviets at the end, the Communist Party hated him or feared him for his talent and for, for his art. What year was this? 84, 83, mid uh, early, uh, early 80s. I think it's one of the greatest films ever made on war. It's quite atrocious. And when he made it, he decided to do it to <clears throat> tell the story of the more than 600 villages destroyed in Belarus by the Nazi. All through the eyes of this young kid, who was shocked during the film, they hypnotized him in several sequences. He was so shocked. Um, he was at the time 13, and at the end of the shooting, his hair turned gray. Uh, I strongly recommend you to watch this film. It's powerful, shocking, and atrocious, but in the most you know, effective, and, and if I can use the word beautiful way. It's, a be it's beautiful, it's cinematic. And it's quite unknown. And I thank to the Criterion, uh, you can see on the Criterion channel. Uh, I wanted to start from a very bleak <laughs> sequence that I'll give you better and a more Luke, uh, say, there's, uplifting. There's a poetry, there's a poetry, poetry between your, your first clip and your last clip. <laughs> yes, there is. Let's go to your second clip now, which is the French film. I'm less surprised this time. It's one of the greatest films ever made, I think. Bresson, I'm an escaped. Why this film and why this sequence? Well, I think um, Antonio and I share many vices. I think <laughs> one is our Catholicism. And I think the, worst, the, I mean, I think the, the, the cinema gave, a, gave us two great Catholic film, uh, filmmakers who happened to be formalist. And uh, that is Hitchcock and Bresson. And for me, this is a very spiritual film. There's a great line. Hi, Leela. There's a great line in um, uh, Bresson's Notes of a Cinemagraph where he says, never use an image when a sound will do. And I noticed in this, you know, you see those hands. It's all you, those hands. You're looking at those hands the whole time. And I noticed 
the sounds, Antonio and I just had this conversation and I noticed the sounds and I realized the magic of those sounds in this sequence. When you're a child, you can listen to your parents from another room. And I think you almost enter this psychological state where you're seeing this kind of Gallic face and increasing degrees of suffering, but you have, you're listening for something the way you do almost when you're little and your parents are in another room and there's something going on you're trying to understand. Um, and that never occurred to me till just this moment. Um, the, his use of sound, the first thing that happens when he's in jail, it, those hands, he gets a hold of a safety pin and, and he gets his handcuffs open. The first thing he does is tap on the wall to talk to the other prisoners, which is as much like prayer as anything. You know, you're trapped in some desolate place and you're just d desperate enough to just scratch after another animal. Um, Would you consider also Scorsese among the great Catholic uh, formalist filmmakers? Say again? Scorsese. Well, it's funny, I just saw that film of his on his new film on Tuesday night, Personality Crisis, uh, which is coming out on Showtime about David Johansson, well, it's about his uh, persona. <laughs> But um, it's an extremely, I was expecting less, what a terrible human being I am. But it's, I, I also found it very moving through sound and music and this journey you go on through the, actually through the music. It's much more intimate than his other concert films and tells a story of the streets in New York and blah, 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 like he can do. But it's, 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 I was thinking of his use of film. I was also thinking of the Colonel Blimp pan, which he said to me he got the idea of in, in um, Raging Bull. How how do you how do you show the end of the of the fight of that last fight of Jake LaMotta? You just pan away because it's not at that beautiful pan into that snow globe of the duel. And Bresson does the opposite here. When the man tries to escape from the car, the camera stays on the close-up of, of, of the other guy, which is quite disorienting, but wonderful. Uh, one more thing I want to tell you about, um, uh, about this film. I see it as an act of fate. This man tries to escape, and at the end, he has faith in someone who might betray him. Right. Right, because he escapes with somebody. No. The, the other thing about it that I just, part of my crazy Catholic, I'm, I'm like stupidly Catholic, <laughs> but I'm not like one of those, oh yeah, I was raised Catholic. No, I became Catholic. I'm not a victim, I'm a volunteer. <laughs> but, the, um, but he starts making, it's a very thingy movie. You can see with the hands and he, he starts making these little, the first thing he figures out how to get wood, little slivers of wood off the bottom and then just camouflage the damage. And, it, and the thinginess for me is very Catholic. It's very carnal. It's like hope entering the physical world. I want to try to, how do you say, to fight your name drop at the beginning. Uh, I was told that... Which name drop? Uh, no, no, it's I not a name, it's a already. place drop, if I can use this expression. Apparently, uh, Bresson owned only one piece of art, but a huge name. And in his home, uh, his home was not decorated at all, like his films. Right. Very simple, naked, with one painting, a small painting of Beato Angelico. I think it says a lot about oh his vision of the world. Oh Nothing but It's perfection. so austere. The film yeah. is so austere. But, as, but you enter, again, you enter a psychological space in it that he creates for you. Let's go now to my second choice, which is, I think, the Italian film. Film historian and film critics uh, write that Fellini's greatness stopped in the 70s. I disagree. I think this is an extraordinary film. Uh, it was a completely disaster at the box office, a fiasco. 
And uh, um, although Fellini was quite successful commercially until the 70s, in the 80s he made a flop after another. And he raised the money for this film uh, through a pasta maker who lost a lot of money on this. <laughs> but why I like this, this scene is it looks like a virtuoso moment, but it's actually the opposite. He's not showing off. He wants to share this joy, this enchantment with us. And, uh, and this is typical Fellini. If you think of uh, that wonderful scene in the Vitelloni when Fausto Franco Fabrizi comes back from his honeymoon and starts dancing in the street, it looks like Fellini is dancing with him. He's stopping the narrative. He's only enjoying the moment. Or in Amarcord when the Rex, the big ship, arrives, he keeps stopping always the story to share. And this is what a true artist does. I, I, it, and is that how a J, that's a continuous clip, right? Yeah. So to go from that, you're so disarmed by this kind of moment. And then the Oscar Wilde looking kid, does that kid <laughs> yes. not look like an Oscar Wilde wannabe? With the the hair, kid yeah. who's, yeah. you know, the, who comes in. With, and, and I love and the end with the two old men who try to do it and they know how to, to, to make music with it. It's but but then the the then to shift to this moment of brutality. Yes. You're so completely disarmed. And then the brutality comes again at the yes. end. I don't know if you're familiar with this film. It's quite tragic, but all of a sudden there is this moment of pure beauty. Let's go now to Mary's third and final choice, which is the Japanese film. Generally, we prefer the period pieces, you know, the great uh, uh, Seven Samurai or Rashomon or even Kagemusha. Uh, but I think this is quite wonderful. Uh, I hope Ian will not correct me, but from what I understand, the original title means more than high and low, heavens and hell. Heaven and, heaven and hell. Heaven and yeah. hell. Can I ask you, why did you pick this film? It's about a, a kidnapping. Yeah. Well, an another formalist. It's, first off, I wanted to see... <laughs> Mufune in a shirt, I don't know. I mean, call me crazy. I wanted to see him not in the... There's something that was... It's such an American story. Um, it's a universal story, the kidnapping story. And it's based on uh, Ed McBain. Ed McBain yeah. novel, King's Ransom. And uh, why did I choose it? Um, again, another formalist, like, what's the matter with me? I think... Uh, I think it was actually Roth who got me interested in, in Kurosawa. And, uh, but as this, I think this film, it's, first off, the formal elements, which I'm an idiot about, but I'm gonna talk about anyway, but is every shot is like a little Renaissance painting. I mean, it's so composed and the, and the, the way they move the choreography, the blocking is so stagey, and it's laid out like a, like a play, and yet you feel like, in a way, it makes you feel like you're in the room, or I kind of feel like I'm in the room, being boxed in, sort of the way the characters are boxed in. And I also, I never saw anything coming. Like, just like you don't see, it's one of the most suspenseful movies I've ever seen in my life, ever, ever, ever. And you just don't see that other kid coming in. Even though two kids left, you don't see the chauffeur's kid coming in. It is also a film about a moral choice. You know, yes. It puts the spectator and the characters facing a moral dilemma. What should I do? And it's about someone who decides to pick hell instead of heaven, basically. But he does... He does it, I mean, at first, he winds up saying that he's going to pay the ransom, but he spends a long time saying he's not, and gets, you ju I just never knew what was going to happen. Let's forget Catholicism now, but do you see spirituality in this film too, or is just, uh, do you see any form of spirituality in this film? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I certainly think, I think any time there's class struggle, I mean, this is a guy who's the king, you know, he's the king of the world, he's looking down on Tokyo from this, he keeps opening the window and looking down, and in fact, the kidnapper conceived the, his hatred for the guy, not from the media or from any of this, but from looking up and seeing him, 
seeing his silhouette on looking down on everybody. And so he wouldn't have been in this position where he not, that's the thing about kidnapping, right? You sort of, so I think, and that last, the, the fact that he come a drug addict, um, supposedly sober, <laughs> but, but the, the drug addiction that gets brought in and the squalor and the, and then that final scene, which I, I know that that's, I actually wanted to show the final scene, which would ruin the movie for all of you, so I was <laughs> advised against it. But um, the final scene is one of the great cinematic moments. It's just, it's, a, it's hair raising. It's a hair raising movie. Watching this wonderful black and white, I remembered something that I didn't say before. Watching the first film, the one by Powell and Pressburger, the film, did you notice how beautiful are the colors? When it was released in this country, it was released in black and white. Don't ask me why. And it was a total flop. Let's watch now uh, my third and last choice. It's, it's an American film. And uh, I still love it. The same way <coughs> I love it the first time I saw it. I'm always very moved by this scene. The way Katie Hurado, I think it's her name, look at, looked at Slim Pickens. <clears throat> and I'm even more moved by the fact that he decides to die in front of a river. I don't know why he does it, but I, I find it very spiritual. It's bit, oh, really? Yes. It really, are you spiritual about rivers in particularly, or <laughs> is it the... Rivers and to a larger place, either a lake or the, or the sea. He wants to go back there. Uh, but the way they look at each other is so sweet, so touching. And, uh, and it's perfect the way Bob Dylan's song, very famous song. The Dylan's song uh, yeah. is genius. And apparently when uh, <coughs> Chris Christopherson suggested to hire Bob Dylan to write the song, Sam Peckinpah asked, who is Bob Dylan? <laughs> and then he asked uh, to um, play a role. Terrible actor, but great, <laughs> great poet and great songwriter. The film was written by Rudy Wurlitzer, not for Sam Pecky, but, but for Monty Hellman. But James Coburn, who always wanted to play Pat Garrett, said the perfect director is Sam Peckinpah, who had in mind Bo Hopkins for uh, Billy the Kid. Then he decided to take Chris Christopherson, who was way too old and not a good actor, to play, <laughs> to play Billy the Kid. The film was completely destroyed by the producers. They cut almost 20 minutes of the original version. And do you know, does anyone know uh, Sam Peckinpah reaction to this? No, what? He hired a killer to kill the producer. <laughs> I'm not joking. True? And, true. Did, they, did and he kill no, him? No, no, it didn't happen because his friends said, this is not exactly what you're supposed to do. <laughs> but, so I think it's a, a forgotten, wonderful film. And uh, Pekinba never had a real hit, maybe a little bit The Getaway. Of course, The Wild Bunch is a cult favorite, but was not really a successful mm, in terms of box office film. This was a disaster. And then I think it starts the decadence of his, also of his art. And at the time, he was completely, he was an alcoholist. And he could shoot only three, four hours per day. But... Again, any filmmaker who is able to give us a scene like this is, is my hero. It's, yeah, it's like amazing. I promise two things. The first one is to give you the name of the writer who believes the cinema is better than literature. It's Chuck Polanik. And the Not sec that good a writer, but okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the second thing is I promise to give you... <clears throat> uh, how do you say? A scene that is not so bleak, like most of the scenes that we saw so far. We have tradition to end with a funny moment, so let's watch together a brief <coughs> comic relief. Yeah, we're some glum girdies, aren't we? <laughs> oh, God, this is so great. Thank you all, but more important, thank you, America, for tonight. I hope you enjoyed the event. Next event will be at the New York Historical Society on May 4th with James Kikri. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonio.